Okay, welcome everybody to one of the few remaining talks. I hope that you are enjoying DEFCON so far. And today, my name is Jakub Czechacek. I work at, work at Red Hat as an open source developer, primarily on a project called DBZoom, where I'm responsible for everything relating to MongoDB and Kubernetes integration, as you might have guessed about a current topic, which is going to be how to run change data capture on top of DBZoom. And I'm joined here by my colleague, Andre Babes, who is our, first and foremost, he's our QE lead, but we also kind of use him as our main ops guy. So thank you for that. Uh, and Ondra is our expert for everything related to performance, and he's also involved in kind of developing a new means how to build our distributions. So uh, today we will talk about what a change data capture is. We will talk about the Bizum project, whether and how it can run on top of Kubernetes, and we will try to have show, uh, we'll try to show a small, more or less realistic uh, use case for, for this tooling. So who already heard about change data capture? Okay, so about half. So I, I've read a book once, or it might have been an article on the internet, I don't remember, and I came across this really nice definition that uh, change data capture is a process of recognizing changes in a source data system and they're delivered to downstream consumer so that this consumer th can take actions based on these changes. It's a really fancy, uh, really fancy definition. It kind of reminds me of the one for monads when it's a monoid in the category of endofactors. Nobody really knows what it means. So a human version of that would be that change data capture allows you to simply subscribe to any data changes inside your database. How that's done? Uh, and this demonstration, we have a show diagram of uh, what's called a log-based change data capture. So every database usually has something called a transaction log. And transaction log, it's kind of a canonical source of truth for databases. So that's where the database actually writes down everything which is happening. So any inserts, updates, deletes, all the schema modification and creations, everything is written in the transaction log. And what we can do is that we can use an external tool, a change data capture tool, which will somehow connect to this log and extract all the information from it transform it into events and send them somewhere, perhaps to Apache Kafka or any broker of your choice, really. Uh, as I said, like basically every database has this transaction log. You might have come across it in multiple different names. So for example, in case of Postgres, it would be a write ahead log. In case of MySQL, it would be transaction log. In case of something like MongoDB, it will be called an op log. And what uh, this change data capture can do for you is that it can help you with various things. Like, for example, you can use it as a tool for continuous replications between two databases, maybe just so that you have a continuous backup, or you want to migrate from one database type to another. So, for example, if you wanted to go from, say, Oracle to Postgres, you could use change data capture. You can use it to populate things like search indexes or, or keep your caches updated. You can use it to feed data analytics pipelines, and it can also help you when you implement uh, microservices because it can be used to kind of uh, uh, implement various microservice-based patterns, such as uh, the Outdoors pattern, which can be used for reliable message sending. So usually, like, right, if you want to store data into database and also send a message to Kafka, it's kind of a problem because how do you do that? Kafka doesn't participate in distributed transactions. So what you can do is instead of actually sending the message to Kafka, you just insert that message into your database in the same database transaction, and you leave it to change data capture tool to deliver that message into Kafka for you. So that would be an outbox pattern. Or if you want to migrate from one monolithic application to several microservices, you can use something called a triangular fig pattern which, by the way, there was a presentation about in this conference, and, and, and many others. We could, really, we could really have a standalone talk on each of these patterns, so we are not going to go much into detail on these. And then bring us to 
tool called Debezium. So who already heard about Debezium? And who heard about Debezium but haven't attended my colleague's talk earlier today? Okay, that's almost the same number of people. So yeah, you might have guessed it. Uh, Debezium is a log-based chain data capture solution. It is kind of a feature-rich platform and kind of a framework. Uh, what we mean by framework is that it's not only a tool, but we also provide a set of SPIs which you can use to implement your own change data capture connectors. It's fully open source uh, with kind of active community at Zulip, at Google Groups, uh, and Stack Overflow, and really, like, DBZoom's been around for a while. And we are used by some rather large companies. So, for example, among our users, you can find Reddit, Shopify, or Ubisoft. And there is a bunch of integration with uh, third-party data warehouses, data processing solutions, or, or platforms. So, for example, we can work with Apache Flink, Apache Iceberg, with Google BigQuery. Uh, we are used by companies such as Decodable or Airbyte. And we even have uh, integrations with application frameworks such as Spring Boot or Quarkus. Uh, amongst other things, DBZoom kind of brings its own format for describing uh, data changes. Uh, in its base form, it's uh, composed of two or three sections. So first of all, we have the description of the data change itself. So we have a section for how the data looked like before the change and after the change. And then we also uh, include some metadata uh, with things such, such like uh, what is the originating database or table? Uh, what, was the position in the what was the position in the transaction log where uh, this, uh, this change originated from? And that, that is particularly important because by knowing the exact position in the transaction log, what we can do in terms of failure is that if we load it down and save it as something called offset, we can just restart and get back to working from where we were. And then we also have other, other attributes, such as what was the type of the operation or when the operation actually happened. And the operation timestamp here is uh, not something uh, we make up as like when we've noticed it. It's actually a piece of information which can be extracted from the transaction log. So we know precisely when the change occurred. Uh, in terms of databases, we really support quite a lot of those. Uh, it could be divided into three categories. The core category are databases which, or co database connectors which are actively supported and maintained by our core development team. Uh, the community ones are those which were initially contributed and potentially are still maintained by external community. We are just, we are just responsible for uh, releasing them and, te and testing them continuously. And then we have a category of completely third-party independent, uh, in independent connectors, which uh, were developed based on the SPIs I've mentioned. So those would include, for example, Yugabyte DB and Scylla DB. So Kubernetes, right? We are here primarily because of Kubernetes. So can DBZoom run on top of Kubernetes? Uh, the answer is yes. It always could. Because DBZoom was primarily conceived as a set of Kafka Connect uh, source connectors. And if you know anything about Kafka Connect and Kubernetes, you probably have heard about this StreamZ Kafka operator, which supports Kafka connectors. And so with the help of StreamZ, you could have always run DBZM on top of Kubernetes. However, what if you want to work in, for example, like a Knative environment and you would want to use cloud events? Well, then I guess you can store cloud events in, uh, in, in your Kafka broker. Uh, but then again, like, what if you don't have Apache Kafka or, or Kafka Connect? Uh, it's actually quite common that our users or potential customers don't have Apache Kafka Connect in their, in their stack, that they use just Kafka without Connect. In that case, uh, you are actually in luck because there are many flavors of DBZoom nowadays. It's not just connectors for Kafka Connect anymore. There is this thing called a DBZoom engine, which is a standalone library which you can use to embed into your, into your application. And there is also this thing called DBZoom server, which kind of provides standalone and lightweight 
and sort of an end-to-end pipeline-like solution that you can just deploy this single pipeline from source uh, to sync. It's powered by Quarkus, uh, and it's built on top of DBZoom engine. So essentially what we did, we, we wrote an application using that embedded engine library, uh, using that embedded engine to run our source connectors, and then we wrote a bunch of sync destinations to where you can deliver your changes. Uh, it's targeted primary on environment without Apache Kafka or, or Kafka Connect. Why would you want to do that? Perhaps you are using a different, a different platform. It's distributing either as a standalone application or as, or as a container image. And when I said that there are quite a few of uh, these sync destinations, I meant it. We target uh, things from various uh, cloud providers through things like Apache Pulsar, Pravega, Infinispan, do things like Kafka or, or HTTP connector. Uh, so I've mentioned that uh, we are distributed as, or DBZoom server is distributed as a container run, so it surely means that it runs on Kubernetes. Uh, well, yes, but for more complex application, running something on top of Kubernetes is rarely just the case of running the, running the container image, right? So the road to get there was a bit longer. Uh, we've started, or the idea of actually using DBZoom on top of Kubernetes is as old as DBZoom 1.2, and it comes from all the way back to 2020, uh, when we've received an external contribution for supporting cloud events as a format for our, our, our change events. Then in 2021, we've added uh, or we've actually released the DBZoom server, so that gave us an alternative to running only in Apache Kafka. And then an important milestone came with DBZoom 1.9, and just two years ago. And that's uh, when an engineer named Chris Baumwamber actually came across the usage when they wanted to, when they wanted to use DBZoom server in Knative environment. However, to do so, they decided to leverage the sync binding of Knative and the ability to essentially send your cloud events to an HTTP webhook. And for that, he wrote and contributed an HTTP sync, which supported the casing environment variable, which is essentially a variable which Knative will inject this webhook endpoint into your application. And he presented a simple demo when he deployed everything uh, streaming data from an external database into Knative broker and processing them through Knative service and potentially delivering somewhere. And he presented this demo on Knative Con EU two years ago. What we've learned from the demo is that, first of all, it was really cool that uh, there is actually a use case for DBZoom with Knative on top of Kubernetes, but that it was also still embarrassingly complicated to set up. Essentially, what you needed to do was create all the conflicts map, the de uh, deployment services, and everything. So we've came to a conclusion that what we need to do is likely write our own operator, which would reduce the number of Kubernetes conflicts. It would give you an easy access to, to metrics, and ideally, you would do that through a single custom resource, which would describe the state of your application. And so we've tried to do so. We are probably succeeding so far, but the challenge was like, how do you write an operator if you are a team of Java engineers? We could learn Go, some of us do know Go, but it's always better if you decide to use a technology which the entire team is familiar, for, uh, familiar with, right? So what they did, we've actually used the Java operator SDK, or more specifically, its extension for Quarkus, and wrote it in that. And so now we have an operator, which we will demonstrate shortly, and you can already use it and install it through both Helm and OLM. So with that, I will pass the word to my colleague to actually show you what you can do with the DBZoom operator. Okay, so we have prepared quite a nice demonstration, but first I would like to just set up the problem statement that we were working with. We found only, or we found an API which doesn't block us every five minutes for IP address, and that was API from CoinCap, where 
you have all information about current crypto prices and how, how actually the market is going. But you don't have information about time there. So eventually, if you don't want to do some analytics or something like that, you need somehow at timestamp and extract it to some data warehouse or something where you can actually mo monitor or visualize them later. So just for better visualization of the problem, here we have some snippet of how, the da how our data looks like. And you can see we have name, symbol, price, and more and more information there. There is no, no timestamp. And the problem is that if something like this happens, when you have an update, so for the database, it is same row, nothing changes other than the price, for example, or market cap, or something like that. So you will essentially lose this piece of information that something changed. This can happen on each of the rows. So what do you want to do? You want to capture all the changes so we have all the information possible. We want to do it in k native environment. It is possible to do it also somewhere else, but we wanted to do it this way. And we want to visualize everything because you know, we can analyze this just from data, but who doesn't like some good graphs? It's nice to show. Yeah, so what we prepared is kind of complicated deployment. So there is Redis time series as our sync that we will post everything. We have Grafana and series of Grafana dashboards. Some of them will be directly connected to Redis because I don't know if you know it, but there is official plugin for Redis time series, so you can query it through the Grafana. We will use Knative eventing, so there is Knative broker. In our specific case, we are using OpenShift cluster, so everything is powered by serverless. And we will use, of course, the Bezium server and the Bezium operator to deploy that, because I don't know if ever of you experiences experiencing uh, exporting the metrics of the Bezium server before the Bezium operator on Kubernetes. It was not an easy task. It took a serious amount of time to build your own image and include the Prometheus agent and everything. And the, the entire description together with all the Bezium pieces you need to completely and to and deploy the demo is available at GitHub so you can either later use the link from the slides or just capture the QR code and it will get you to, to GitHub page where everything is already prepared. Okay, so there is just schema of the demo that I will show you just in a minute. This is the complete one. You can see that we have some crypto app. Let's say there is nothing special in the app. It just queries the rest endpoint of the API. This is essentially our legacy application which runs somewhere potentially outside of the, of the cluster that's the one which provides the cryptocurrency data, and you cannot do anything about it other than read the database. Yeah, and then I think I have already mentioned we have the Bezium, we have Knative eventing, and we have Redis and Grafana. What I will show you is the deployment of, of these parts. Uh, we have not included Redis and Postgres because it takes some time and we don't want to bother you for too, much, too long. <laughs> Yeah, and in this part, uh, one thing which we will need to do need need to also have is like DBZoom is going to be used to capture the changes, is going to deliver them into the Knative broker, and then we need to somehow react to these cloud events. If there is an event in the broker, we need to trigger a service. is going to be a Knative service in our case, which is going to extract data from the event and store them as time series in in, in Redis. And in our case. We are not going to spend time about implementing that service, but just know that it, it's implemented in, in Quarkus, more specifically in a framework called Funky, and this is this entire implementation. So this is how easy it was to actually implement a service which captures, which receives a cloud event. It just takes the after portion of the, of the, of the data delivered by, by Debezium. Now it easily extracts the the timestamp, which was 
conveniently added by Debezium, and it just stores them into Redis with some labels. That's all it does. Okay, let me just. We have prepared this, this script that you wanna that you can use if you want to check out demo by yourself. Uh, Is it okay? No? Okay, so the first step that we want to go is to deploy Genative Broker. It's essentially deployed now. In our case, we are just using a simple memory backed broker, but it could also be something like an Apache Kafka based broker or whatever. Then we are going to deploy the Bizium server, which essentially is deployed via the Bizium operator. And you can see that besides just the Bizium server, we are also deploying the sync binding, which is essentially the part for Knative eventing that will just pass the the cloud the sync specific HTTP endpoint for Knative. Yeah, for for the configuration of the Bizium, which is the most important part, if you if you can scroll a bit up on train. Yeah, so this is this is essentially configuration which specifies that we want to use. In this case, uh, the Bizium uh, server in version 2.7 beta, that's there only because we haven't uh, released a final yet. Uh, then there's a simple configuration for Quarkus, and uh, then you can see that we are enabling metrics. We are going to use an HTTP thing because that's the other way of integrating with Knative. We enable cloud events as format, and then the last part is a configuration of a PostgreSQL source database, uh, if you can go a bit down. One particular interesting thing is that uh, you can actually store your credential in secret, and then you can refer to them in, uh, in the configuration values of the, of the so so source config. Uh, in future, we want to further simplify certain things. For example, like instead of enabling sync, uh, HTTP sync and specifying cloud events format, you would just use a single configuration to say that you are going to work in Knative environment and everything, all the related configuration would be set up for you. But for now, we are taking rather low level, but, but good granularity configuration approach. Okay, now you can see that we will deploy our collector service. That is basically the code that we showed earlier. And as, as least we will deploy the, the Grafana dashboard. Now we have everything deployed. We can just check the pod. You can see that we have the Bizium operator which was already prepared and we have the Bizium server already running. And we can take a look into our Grafana. Yes. And we have two dashboards. The first one is for the Bizium metric. It's sure it's not filled yet. We have images that is running because ah, it, it, first if you, it, it will already show something if you just narrow it down to like five minutes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you can see that it's already already starting. It's been about four and a half seconds since there was the last event. Uh, this can work in real time or near real time. In this case, there is a series of kind of unfortunate events where there is a certain period under which the the legacy application update is data, and there is also a period on which Prometheus met, scrapes the matrix, and there is also a, a refresh period on top of the Grafana, so this kind of creates this artificial light, which is not really there. Okay, and just our main goal here was to capture the changes of, uh, the changes of cryptocurrencies from Redis. Let's see. We have this interactive queries when, where we query all the all the cryptos that we have there, so you can then just just choose whichever is important to you. And you can see this is from last two minutes, but if I go back to the presentation, there is the yeah. So this is how it can look like if it runs for for a longer period of time. This is essentially a graph showcasing the price of Ethereum between. Last uh, last night and today morning. And I think that's it from our demo. So, 
Thank you for listening. This was a means of like showcasing you how you can actually transform your old legacy database into a stream of time series, time series data and visualize them easily on top of Kubernetes. And if you have any questions, just shoot at us and we will try to answer them. Yes? Okay, so the question is like, how does uh, how does DBZoom remember what was the last database entry it processed from the transaction log? Yeah, so the way we do it is that we actually store the position from the transaction log and we commit it into a persistent storage, and if it and that's committed only when we know that we've processed that we've processed that uh, that entry. So this way, when we restart or crash and start back up we start from that position. And the way this, this particular position looks like differs from database to database. In, uh, in our particular case, if we were to discard DBZoom, then uh, purely because you could have seen that there was a memory store, then in our case it would be ephemeral, but we could have used something like Redis for storing, a Kafka for story, uh, storage, or we could use uh, even like a file store, which would then mean that the offsets would be committed to a file system. And let's be honest, this doesn't have to necessarily work every time if you all, if Dibisium is down for a really long time and you will also already cyclically rewrite your transaction log and that specific, uh, that specific position will not be available, then you will have to do something like snapshotting or something. Yeah, like yeah that of course, it, it, it depends on for, for how long you are, you, you are down, but if the, the, if that position goes, is essentially thrown outside of the transaction log, then what we do is that we capture all the existing data already in the database through a process we call a snapshot. Any, any other questions? Okay, in that case, thank you for listening. Uh, we have a few teachers, the museum teachers here. Uh, some are in lar larger, lar larger sizes, so if you want a t-shirt, just grab one, it's on the first come, first serve basis. <laughs>